Well, good morning, church. Let's stand as we get ready to worship. I've been thinking about this is uh, the day we celebrate this weekend of our independence. And, and I'm thankful today that we get an opportunity and a, to worship our King freely in this house. So, Father God, we just thank you on this day to be in your house. We thank you for an opportunity to worship a living and resurrected King today. And Lord God, I pray that we will not be quiet, Lord God, that we will be loud and we will worship you with every breath that we have in our lungs, Lord God, because you're worthy of our praise. And you are worthy of our praise, Lord God. We thank you that not only do we celebrate the independence that we have as a nation, but because of you and sending your son Jesus to die on the cross, we can be free and be free from sin, free from guilt, free from shame. So today we celebrate that we are living as free men and women of God today, Lord God. So Lord, I pray that you will be glorified in this house. We honor you today. We worship you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Shame at the 
Your faithfulness is clear to me. It's constant every day. In the morning you sing over me. And I receive. And every breath I breathe an invitation to believe you are creating something good. Though this season doesn't tell my story, I know you're a mountain for me. You're just
pride of Zion, prophet spoke, our Messiah, flesh and bone, you alone are worthy to open up the scroll.
Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Woo. So first thing is, of course, we have our tithes and offerings. Chip on the screen, three ways to give. They're going around with the baskets as well. If you fill out the envelope and you don't have time to put it in the basket, there is boxes in the back on each side of the wall that you can also put it in. We also have connection cards on the back of your seat. If you're new here and you'd like to fill that out, put that also in the box or you can put it in the basket. That would be great. One of our staff and team would be reaching out to you and praying for you or any type of prayer requests that you have or just doing life with you. Um, also... There's a cornhole sign up outside. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. <laughs> we also have, I lost my train of thought. We also have, oh, your invited cards as well. Take those. Feel free to take those. Invite your neighbors. Invite your friends, family, those who don't have a church home. Get that out to them and go from there. And next, we also have Wednesdays. I want to talk about Wednesdays, our upper room. It's every Wednesday, 7.15 p.m. This Wednesday, we're going to have Marla speaking. She will be teaching and leading prayer. It's awesome. Yes. But again, it's 715 every Wednesday. It's prayer. It's worship and prayer. Great time out. Um, I want to introduce, or not introduce, because y'all know them, but I want to bring the Millers up because they are actually going to be talking about their mission trip a couple weeks ago. So we're going to hear from them. Uh, Jude, just run the pictures as they're talking, will you? You'll see some really cool pictures. They can explain. Good morning, everybody. God is good, right? Amen. Amen. Gloria a Dios, as how they would say out there. <laughs> we had spent um, over a week in Central America. I'm not going to name the uh, the nation because this is one of the you know bitter about pictures and everything that we're going to be showing. Um, this here was later on in the middle of the week. This was a garbage dump, and praise God, we had church on a garbage dump. And amongst the flies and the buzzards and the mangy dogs, we ministered the gospel to these people. We shared God's love to these people. Um, there was one woman that. just looked at me like, why would you want to hug me? That made me want to hug her more. And it's interesting because somebody that probably in their country would probably be the, what is that? The bottom of the barrel in regards to people interacting with them. They were like considered the leper. And it was interesting because when I hugged her, I didn't care what she looked like, how she smelt, how dirty her clothes were, how many flies were on her. I didn't see that. I didn't see that on her. I see a woman that needed Jesus' hug to be seen. You can keep the pictures on a reel. We'll just, as I turn around and see a certain picture and remember something, I'll, I'll discuss it. But there was a team of 67 of us in total that had went. We went to the capital cities where we stayed and we branched out from there. There was four different groups. There was the medical team. There was an outreach evangelistic team. There was a children's ministry team. And then there was a building team because they were building a pastor's house in the mountainside. So there was four different teams that went between the 67 of us. And every morning we would wake up in our hotel, we'd have breakfast, a devotional, and then we'd go about our ways. Um, we were part of the outreach evangelistic team, and we went to three different prisons, and we were supposed to do two different hospitals, but we only made it to one. And then um, 
we were also in the garbage dump. We had church, a church service in the dump. And then we also were in the red light district where the, um, a lot of the homeless, a lot of the alcoholics, a lot of the prostitutes are. And we were in, in two different blocks that we went to and we ministered to, to these women. Um, yeah, there's, that's my wife there at the garbage dump um, ministering to those people. Uh, out of all the ministries that they do, they get a lot of fruit out of those ministries. We, we partner with a church that has 12 churches underneath them. And it's a pretty big church. It's about 700 members in the main church itself. And that pastor was actually ex, an ex-assassin for the cartel and has an amazing testimony. Um, the cartels is a big part of this nation's world. Like the people in the dump go there, they live in tin shacks around the dump, and they go to the dump in the morning and pick through the trash, and they get some plastic or some steel to recycle. And they recycle it, and they get pennies for it, and then the cartels take a percentage of that money for allowing them to, sell, to go through the trash. So they're amongst the flies, the, the buzzards, the cows, the dogs, Jesus came, and Jesus touched these people, and we fed them. And some of them received Christ that day. There was a gentleman that was an, a former evangelist that had just been down on his, lo- on his on life. And we were able to, to just encourage him and, and minister to him and get him fired back up to get back to where God had called him to be. And uh, it's, a, it was a gen- it's a generational curse and just a poverty mentality. So out of all the ministries they do, they see fruit come out of that. The rest, men's restoration house and the women they minister to and the, the women that they pull out, out of the streets, um, they see a lot of fruit. But the garbage dump is one of the hardest ones that they are still fighting because there, it's just a, a mentality that these people have and they think that that's all there is to life. So just pray for those people if, you, if it ever comes to your memory. Now when we ministered in the streets, we, we always feed them too. They partner with an organization called Feed the Hungry. And they always feed them. So they give a message first. We give a testimony. We worship. And then we feed them. And then uh, a full belly creates listening ears. And then we just continue ministering the gospel to, to these people. Um, one of the women that, um, that's in one of the prisons with Angie praying for a woman. Um, and one of the, the street ministries, the lady that's in charge of it, she actually came off of the streets. She's a fruit of that ministry. And she just has such a passion for those women that think that they have to continue in that lifestyle. Um, the, that's us at another one of the penitentiaries. Uh, that was in Choloteca. Um, that was the second one. The first one was the women's uh, prison we went to. And the women keep their babies with them when they have them up to the age of five. Um, in the prisons, it's not like American prisons. You, they don't feed you. You have to feed yourself. You have to make things and you have to sell them or you become bought out by the cartel. You have two options and those are your two options. So when we went to the women's prison, they told us, no, we can't come in. And the guards would stand there with their guns and we're like, yeah, we're coming in. And all of our paperwork is done. Everything was submitted. And they still said, no, we're not letting you in. And we had prayed and then the warden from up in the guard tower called down and ordered them to let us in. So we were like, praise God, you know, he let us in. We knew we were meant to be there. Um, Yeah, I want to share something a little bit different. Um, One thing that, um, one thing that I was very observant is the church. Church didn't have nothing fancy. The church didn't, I mean, they had great sound systems and everything like that. But the church had the heart. They had the heart of God. Like, they didn't care about titles. They didn't care about promotions in the church. They cared about going out and getting as many people saved and bringing them back into the church. That was their ultimate mission, and it was very evident that that's all they cared about was getting people saved and restored and healed and made whole. And um, and that was something that really caught my attention regarding other nations in the world. Other nations in the world don't have a, um, don't have no agenda. Their only agenda is Jesus. And then we 
come home. And our agenda is not Jesus. Come back. Sit in our seat. Worship. Then what? Then what? I want that here. I want that to become, become contagious here. But it comes with a cost. And I'll tell you my cost. I wasn't going to, but I'll tell you. Two and a half years ago, we were in another country. And I was in a hospital. I had surgery, and they didn't treat me very well. And I processed it these last two and a half years here in America. And I got inner healing. I heal, you know, um, I dealt with a lot of things. Well, like he said, one of the places we went to was a hospital. And I said, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. So the bus parks, and I see this building, and I remember. I remember everything that building represented in my life. I remember how much it destroyed me internally. I remembered everything. It's like I went back into, into the past. And I had a choice to make that day. Either stay on the bus or get off the bus. Pastor's been talking about moving forward. So moving forward means you have to decide if you're going to get on the bus or stay off the bus. Get on the bus or stay, get off the bus. And at that moment, I realized I had to get off the bus. So I got off the bus and I stood across the street. So maybe where you guys are is where the hospital is. And, and I'm on this side and the lady's talking. I don't even hear her talking. And I just see the building. And something inside of me said, run, Angie, run. Run back to the bus. And in my spirit, I felt the spirit of the Lord say, no, Angie, go head on at this hospital. So I told my husband, I'm going back to the bus. So I started walking, and this is no joke. I started walking. I got in the middle of the street. I started walking to the bus, and I had my eyes on the bus. And all of a sudden, I could feel the spirit of God moving me back to the hospital. I didn't even want to go there. I wasn't even walking there. And all of a sudden, something took over my body, and I ended up moving and I ended up right in front of where I didn't want to be. And I stood there and all I could do is weep looking at this building and what it meant to me. And some of you have buildings like that. Some of you have situations like that. And we run from them because we say what's in the past is in the past. But that's not true. So I stood there and I cried. And I had a mask on so people couldn't really see. And a lot of the people in the team didn't know anything about me. And I cried. And I heard the Lord say, Angie, raise your hands and pray for these people. And I said, why? Nobody was praying for me. Nobody was outside my window praying for my healing. No one was there for me. And Jesus said no one was there for me either. But I still did it. And how can you, like, say anything to that, right? So anyways, I remember raising my hand. And I tried with everything I had. But it was interesting because it wasn't me that needed to pray. It was the Holy Spirit that needed to pray. And that's where I missed it for a minute because as soon as I opened my mouth, I allowed the Holy Spirit to pray in my behalf. And he did in the midst of my flesh and my pain and my memories, God intervened for in my behalf and prayed for me. And then I said, Lord, what do I do with this mountain in front of me? What do I do with this Goliath standing in front of me? And that song, Roar, Wrecked Me, or Lion, sorry. Because I had to stand there and I had to decide, will I roar at that mountain or will I go home knowing that the enemy will always have something on me as a missionary, no matter what country I go to, he has a stronghold over me that will make me hesitate because of my fear of that building. And I knew I had to run through it. And it's funny how God talks to me. 
because he was like, so you're a Marine, right, Angie? And I was like, oh, no, here we go. You know, the Lord knows how to talk to me sometimes. And he says, you don't leave no man behind. And he's like, and when you run, you run. You run forward whether you die or you live, but at least you know you didn't cower out and run to the other direction. So what are you going to do, Angie? Are you going to run into that hospital or are you going to run away? Because either way, you're going to die. So I said, okay, what do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to speak to your mountain. And I said, okay, how do I do that? Well, I wasn't listening to what was going on. A lady comes around and she says, hey, Angie, they're needing someone to speak in the microphone and pray over the hospital. And she said, and the Lord said, it's you. <laughs> and as soon as they said that to me, she said that to me, I started crying because I was like, Lord, like, what are you trying to do to me? But it was something crazy because I went up to the front and I had a different translator and one of the guys that was in my team says, no, I'm translating for Angie. So he was like, I got you, Angie, let's do this. So I stood there and I waited a minute because I remembered the pain of that place. I remembered the cost to forgive somebody that I didn't even know. <laughs> and I remember the first thing I said was for two and a half years, I've been afraid of you. <laughs> because I almost died here. And I said stuff about, you know, being alone and feeling abandoned, feeling forgotten, being naked, all alone, just people on a phone, but nobody present, no one I could see. And then it was interesting because it was like I started talking in fear, like it was like, not in fear, but it was like when I ran in there, it was almost like I was running in scared. But then as I started talking, it was like all of a sudden I felt like this authority came over me. Like, I don't even understand how it happened because it had to be supernatural. But then all of a sudden I just started like yelling at the building like, I remember now, Satan. I remember now because Jesus met me in that room and he saved me that day. And when he saved me that day, he saved my whole floor that day. And then I said, you know what, and if that happens, that means that I have now the authority to heal this whole building today. Because this mountain is my mountain, and I claim this mountain. And I say, if I've claimed this mountain and I ran through this mountain, that means that I have the authority to break down this mountain and cut its head off. And I'm telling you, when I did that... And it's not me, guys, okay? When I did that, I felt like in the spirit, I yelled something. I don't even know what I roared. I roared something three times. I mean, I screamed as loud as I can at that building. And it felt so good. And I want to encourage you guys because it felt so good to go to a scary place and say, you know what? You tormented me for years, but I'm free of you. I'm free of you. And when I did that, and I, like in the spirit, I just, just, just started nunchucking everywhere. <laughs> and it was like, when I did that, I felt like the, I felt like my spirit was like, yes, yes. And all of a sudden, it was felt like in my obedience, I felt like a floodgate of like anointing coming out. And I can't even explain that. It was just like a river of, of because of my obedience, like God just unwailed a wave over me, crashing into me for my victory. And then and it was crazy because even the Lord, the Lord says, okay, Angie, you know on your belt? And I said, yeah. He goes, you know how back in the day they put your head on a stake and they say, remember what I did. And the Lord says, well, in your belt in hell, they're going to remember what you did. And I cried. And I cried. 
but that building no longer defines who I am. And that building doesn't stop me from the nations anymore. Actually, it just made me want to go more because I'm not afraid anymore of what the enemy can do because my God is greater. My God is stronger. And when he roars with me, I roar with him. When I roar him, he roars with me. And every time that happened, I knew that my God had my back. And I want to encourage you guys in that. That was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. The hardest thing I've ever done. But I'll tell you what. You have to move forward. You have to. But in order to move forward, I had to go there. I had to go to that place. That place where it broke me. And I had to, in return, go back and claim that brokenness as like in Nehemiah's wall. He said, I claim that wall even though it's broken, but you're not broken. I'm just putting you back together better than what you were when you originally started. But somebody has to believe in you. And that's me now. I'm the one that's going to believe in those that are Nehemiah's walls that are crashed down and they don't feel like they have any purpose anymore. And to say, oh no, but God says, you do, so let's build the wall. <laughs> this whole trip, God had a sense of humor. Because the two biggest struggles in our lives from previous overseas was hospital, and for me, it was prison. And God, normally, when we go on a short-term trip, we go with our friend. You've seen the picture of the doctor there taking, the, listening to the lady's lungs. That's a really, really good friend of ours. And he always leads the medical part of that. Angie worked for him. We're really close. And we always go with him. She's been with him all over Asia. And for whatever reason, the Lord said, nope, you guys are not doing medical this, this time. You guys are going on the evangelism and the outreach team. And we're like, okay. And then when we find out what we're doing, we're like, okay, you've got a sense of humor, Lord. Because these are two of our biggest struggles. But it was, it was so freeing and so amazing to see a move of God in the prison. In the men's prison, in both men's prison and in the women's prison just to see the Holy Spirit move in that church, their own church plant in prison. We were worshiping the Lord so much we didn't even realize we were in prison. And to see these guys, the former assassins and former cartel members, drug dealers, all of that, drug mules, to see them their lives now and how God had transformed them, it just it blows your mind. The worst of the worst, God grabbed a hold of their heart and turned them into the, the, the greatest men of God that you would ever meet. So I'm not going to take up too much more time because I'll be real quick. So uh, all in all, we've seen signs, wonders, miracles. We've seen hundreds of people come to know Christ in that country. And not only did they come to know Christ, but they got connected in their villages. There was always a church that they are associated with that they connected them to. So it wasn't just like, oh, we run out there, who wants to know Jesus? Everybody raise their hand, we know Jesus, and we leave. We make sure they're connected so they can begin to get discipled and begin to get the word fed into them and begin to grow in their relationship with Christ to stay strong in Christ. So that's very important that, that whenever we do evangelism like that, we always have some type of network of related pastors or, you know, village churches that we know are strong churches, and we get them tied into those churches so that they're just not, you know, in the wind once they become saved. The second hospital we were supposed to go to, it kind of got transferred around. Our schedule got switched up. And on any mission trip, our motto always is, you know, blessed is the flexible, for they shall not be bent out of shape. Because when you're on a trip, you have to be flexible. And, you know, you can't get angry because you didn't get your coffee that morning or you didn't get your eight hours of sleep that night before. You know, you have to be flexible. So we ended up not going to the hospital, but they said, let's just drive down an hour in the back of the pickup trucks and find a house and let's just start ministering. So we drove an hour down this cobblestone road in the back of the pickup trucks and we seen a house that had a big yard. So 
we jumped out and started blowing up balloons and kids and people just came out of everywhere. And then all of a sudden we turned around and there was 300 people that had surrounded us. And so they, they, did, they did a children's ministry and they gave them balloons and gave them ice cream and they ministered to them. And we'd seen about 15 kids and like seven adults give their lives to Christ right there. Even, even our bus driver gave his life to the Lord at that ministry spot there. And he said, this is for real. I'm done living my life like I have been. I want Jesus. So it was just amazing, the impromptu, let's just have a block party. And we've seen people come to Christ and we've seen two women get healed. Because we offered prayer for those that had, back, that had pain or sickness. And this lady said, I can't hardly walk my back, my back, you know. And they laid, we laid hands on her, and the Holy Spirit healed her. She got up, and she was dancing around, and we praise Jesus. So, in all in all, there was a lot of fruit and a lot of great ministry time, and we hit the ground running. But sometimes we want to see these things, and we want to see these great things happen. But sometimes, as my wife had said, it's, that stuff comes at a cost. Just remember that. And when you say yes to Jesus... And yes to an obedient heart and yes to what the Lord's asking you to do. There's going to be ten other things that you've got to say no to and that are going to be hard to say no to. So, thank you. Isn't that good? I want you to see something. Thank you, Jeff and Angie, for sharing. I think what Angie did up here and share was very powerful. And why I say it's very powerful is because we all begin to think that we walk with the Lord and, and things happen and, and we, get, we forget that God still wants more from us. And he's, he's chasing after you to be really free. There's a freedom, but there's a, there's a, a real price. There's a real freedom because of the call that Jeff and Angie have. And, uh, and as I've been thinking about that, that price, and I've been thinking about what happened, you know, with Roe versus Wade, and, and then I saw, I don't know if you saw the coach that won his battle in court, and now he can pray on the football field in his high school. I felt like the Lord, the Lord was telling me, hear me. I feel like there's a great awakening that's coming. But the problem is, are we going to be a part of it or are we going to be sleeping? To be a part of it requires the cost that Angie was talking about. To be a part of it requires us to really be able to face these things, even Jeff facing with prison. It's, it's facing these things that, that we are, we've like hidden in, in the low, low, low that no one knows and and, and I'm good, and I'm up here worshiping Jesus, but inside, there's still that little bit of thing that if he calls you to do, you're like, nope, not going to do that one. But there's going to be a price. That's why I believe God's called Redemption City to be on these series that we're doing. We're doing our healing service July 17th and doing all these things. I think it's because he wants us to be ready for a great awakening. He wants us to be free. The price that he prayed, paid, the freedom that he has. And to talk about freedom today, well not today, tomorrow, but today as a church, we celebrate our nation's birthday. And I want you to think about that. It was a little over two and a quarter centuries ago that the United States was born. And, and the celebration of our nation's birthday is really a celebration of freedom. We celebrate the precious gift of freedom we have because of the price that others paid. Amen. That's why we're here today. But I want you to think about this. Today, as we worship in the security and comfort, we must remember the price of freedom is always paid in blood. Hmm. 2,000 years ago, a young man's blood was spilled on the ground so that you and I could all experience freedom. And it's only in Christ Jesus that we will find true freedom. So today I want to talk about the freedom that we get to experience because of Christ and the power that was 
paid on that cross many years ago and the freedom, that freedom of shame, freedom of guilt, freedom. There's a lot of freedoms that we can experience that we're not experiencing that today I want you all to experience. Freedom. So as you get ready to turn to John's gospel, John chapter 8, we're going to be in John's gospel chapter 8. While you guys are getting your Bibles ready before we stand, I want to say um, thank you on behalf of my mother and my family for all the messages and the condolences and the, the emails and the cards and everything. Um, it has been a very difficult season. Losing your father is never an easy season, but it's easier when you have Christ in your heart, number one. And two, to know that you have people that are praying for you and supporting you. And so thank you for that. I wanted to make sure that we shared that and say thank you to everyone who has been a part of that and been praying for us and giving us and loving on us. And um, it, it's not that it's easy, it just makes it a little easier, you know what I mean? But I'm thankful that my dad has reached his triumphal entry. And he has received his reward. And I, and I got to, my dad passed away on Tuesday. And I'm so thankful that I didn't say goodbye, Dad. I said, until I see you again. Because the hope that we have is that we know this is not a goodbye forever. This is just, I'll see you again. Amen. Let's look at John chapter 8, verse 34. John chapter 8, verse 34. If you'll stand with me for the reading of the word of God. John chapter 8, verse 34 says this. Jesus replied, I assure you that everyone who sins is a slave of sin. If you're everyone, say amen. Okay. That's dark, Jeff. You just had us um, amen that we're slaves to sin. No, there's more. Verse 35, a slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the Son sets you free, church, you will indeed be free. I'll say it again. If the Son sets you free, you are truly free. Father, I just honor you today. I thank you that in your word we can recognize the freedoms that we get to experience because of the price that you sent your Son to pay for us. I thank you that you didn't just call us into a relationship with us and leave us, but you called us, cleaned us, getting us ready for a purpose and a mission and a plan. I thank you that you see each individual as a part of the family who has accepted the Lord as their Savior, a part of the family. But, Lord, I thank you most of all that you did not create mistakes. You did not say, oops, I didn't mean to do that one. But you have looked at every person that has been born and that is, that is being, Lord, that you will see them with a purpose and a plan. And today I pray that this church gets on fire for the plan that you have for us. And that we will be a part of the great awakening. And we'll be a part of the great shaking that's happening, not just in our nation, but in our city. That there will be such a fire in our bellies to see our families and our neighbors one for you, Lord. That we'll have a burden like we've never had before. So, Lord, I thank you that on this Independence Day that we get to celebrate our freedoms, Lord. I thank you that we get to celebrate the greatest freedom of all. And I pray that your words will come alive to us like we've never seen before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want you to look later. The Apostle Paul wrote these words regarding the work of Jesus and setting us free. Look at Romans Chapter 8, verse 2, it says, and because you belong to him, if you belong to him, that means you're a Christian, which means you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So if you're a Christian today, you've accepted him as Lord and your Savior, say amen. It says, and because you, church, belong to him, the power of the living, life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Let's stay right there. And because you belong to him, the power, the power, it's not a little measly 
oh, you're free now. There's a roar behind it. There's a power behind it. The power of the life-giving spirit has freed you. Someone say free. Freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Notice that the power of sin is key here. He just didn't want you to hurry up and say a nice little prayer and be on your way. He wants to set you free so you don't have to keep living in that garbage, but you could be who he created you to be in the heavenlies. The power, Pastor Jeff, how, is, how am I going to be set free from my addiction of alcohol or drugs or whatever it may be? You're right. On your own, you don't have the power to do that. But with the power of the life-giving spirit, he can set you free and you can walk away from that sin that, in, that bonded you all these years. That's what we're doing today. Today, <laughs> daily, so look, uh, I, this is what I always try to say whenever we do a Mother's Day, Father's Day. I hate that it's just we celebrate them once, day, once, a, once a year. But today, look, daily we should celebrate our independence from the tyranny and bondage of guilt, sin, fear, and death. An independence that was won over 2,000 years ago. So today I want to talk to you quickly about some of the things that we get to experience the freedom from. If you write this one down, today you and I can experience freedom from guilt. Our past can't haunt us. I'll say it again. Our past can't haunt us. Pastor Jeff, then why, does, why am I always reminded of my past? You're reminded of your past because the enemy wants to drag you back into the same mud hole that you found you in. But you just remind the enemy that he has to go back to hell. He has no power over you unless you give him authority and that you're free from that past. Because the key word here and the word that should be shouted on our Facebooks today is forgiven. You are forgiven Period. In a single victorious stroke of life, all three, look at this, next slide. All three, sin, guilt, and death are gone. The gift of our master, Jesus Christ. That's what was paid those 2,000 years ago. Pastor Jeff, do you have any scripture that you would like for us to write down? Well, cool, I do. Look at this, 1 Corinthians, write this down, fit, uh, chapter 15. 56 and 57, it says, for sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But, verse 57, but thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, I am sad that my father is gone, but I don't have to worry because he is in eternity with my kingdom father. Thank God he has given us victory. Tell your neighbor you're victorious this morning. That's right. You're victorious. Here's another one. Write this down. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. This is amplified. It says, in him we have redemption. That is, our that is our deliverance and salvation through his blood, which paid the penalty for our sin and resulted in the forgiveness, the complete pardon. Someone say complete. The complete pardon of our sin in accordance with the riches of his grace. Verse 8, here's the key, which our daddy has lavished on us. In all wisdom and understanding with practical insight. Our daddy has unlavished this forgiveness, this love, and this grace if you'll accept it today. Just for fun, I like throwing in the message sometimes because it always makes me laugh. Well, not always, but there's words in there that are like, this is really cute. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, 7 through 8, the message. It says, because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross, we're a free people. 
free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all of our what? Oh, then why do you keep carrying all the garbage that you've already been free of? And not just barely free, oh, this is what I like about it. You're in church, you're not just barely free either, you're abundantly free. He thought of everything, provided for everything we could possibly need, letting us in on the plans. He took such delight in making. Do you know your daddy created you with a plan and purpose, but he didn't create you and say, good luck, I hope you figure it out. He actually wants to let you know what his plans are for you. And the first thing he wants you to know is that he wants you to be set free of the garbage that you've been carrying for years. The first thing he wants you to know is, son or daughter, you don't have to live this way anymore. You don't have to be in this shame anymore, this guilt, the things that were happened to years ago. You're free of That's the first thing. But then he says, son or daughter, now that I know you and you will know me, I want you to know that I have a plan for your life. You know, I said... <laughs> Last week, that is really, I, I, it was not in my notes. The Holy Spirit just said it, and I've been thinking about it. Well, I said last week, I said, sometimes the problem is we ask God, how come he's not speaking? And the problem is, is not he's not speaking, is we're here, and he's already moved forward, like Angie's talked about, so we missed the voice. So because I'm stuck in here, I'm missing what he's trying to do. My dad used to always tell me all the time, Jeffrey, you know, the Holy Spirit never quits talking to you. The problem is for people is that you get so used to turning him out that then you can no longer hear his voice. But it does not change that our daddy's not good and that he still desires to have that relationship with you. Some of us, and you know some people that are teetering right there on that line where it's getting easier and easier to no longer hear the voice of Jesus. He's not done talking to you. You just aren't listening. I say this a lot. Is that when Everett Clay would come in a room and he would say my name, I could hear his voice over anything else that was going on because I knew my daddy. But if someone who I didn't know came in and said my name and there's a lot of noise, I wouldn't know they were calling my name because I'd be distracted. Some of us know the voice of God, but we're allowing the distractions to overwhelm his voice. Because when we come to Jesus and let him set us free, church, we are free from guilt. Freedom from guilt. Freedom from guilt. So I want to ask you this question. <laughs> this, this is what I love about what Jeff and Angie did today. We forget that, that we need to be vulnerable and honest and real. And so I'm going to ask you to put aside how long you've been walking with the Lord, what title you are, whether you've been here for 50 years or two days or whether any of this. I want to ask you a real question because this is a real reality that a lot of us struggle with. Look at this next slide. Have you been dragging your past around? You've done things in the past that have hurt others and hurt you. You failed miserably in the past. You failed at your marriage maybe. You failed at parenting. You failed financially because of your own ir irresponsibility. You failed at religion. It's just too hard to keep all those rules. I hear that a lot. Next slide. You failed. You failed. You failed. The, the one thing that we heard a lot, especially when I was pastoring in Kent, was this. Why would God ever want to use someone like me? You don't know my past. I'm on my eighth wife. I've had three bankruptcies. I've had, and they have all these things, and they just, the enemy just keeps reminding them. Society keeps reminding them, what a failure you are. What a failure. You failed, you failed. 
you've come up and asked for prayer, and yet you keep dealing with the same stuff. You failed. You failed. You failed. The enemy's whispering loud. You failed. But look at this next slide. The guilt of your failures and poor choices is dragging around behind you, but is it keeping you from being who you're called to be? Why is it church? I used to... I used to always get blown away with that statistic. 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. And you've heard it. Why does that happen? And I don't think that we have a church that's full of lazy people. I don't think that. I think the church as a globe just feels like a failure and they have nothing to offer so they don't do anything. Because what can I do? They already have that. Someone else would be better at doing that. What a, someone else could do this better. Oh, and I want to tell you, church, you can be free of all that. See, today, the next slide says, today is that day that you can finally experience the freedom that Christ had for you. Freedom from guilt. The next one, as we quickly move, freedom coming from consequence. Christ died in our place. I don't have to die on the cross. I don't have to be whipped so bad that you couldn't even recognize who I am. I don't have to be beaten so bad that you would literally, they literally saw pieces of Jesus' flesh were dangling off of his body. He paid that price for you and I. We don't have to have consequence. We all know when the law is broken, there is consequences. The next slide says, well, we all know that. And, and, and the guilt we just talked about is consequence. The Bible teaches us that we will all face a judgment. Pastor Jeff, where do you see that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It says, and just as each person is destined to die once, and after that they comes what? So the verse tells us there's a consequence for our sin. What is that consequence? Well, Romans 6, 23 states it clearly. For the wages of sin is what? But the gift of God is eternal life. The key word here is that Christ has already dealt with the consequence for our sin. The next slide says that. It says it's not that the ultimate consequence isn't required. It's just that he already paid it for you. When Jesus died on the cross, he was receiving the consequences of my sin and your sin. And he took that for us. In John chapter 19, we read the story of the death of Jesus Christ. It says, it is finished. You've heard this a lot if you've been in the church. It is finished is the most, is not the most accurate translation in the original text. The word translated finished is a commercial, commercial word that means it is paid. The debt is paid in full. Your debt is paid in full. So when Jesus died on the cross, he paid your debt and my debt in full and set us free from the ultimate consequence of sin. So this is where we're a little different. <laughs> Please don't misunderstand me. There's still consequences for our sin. If you speed to run, if you choose uh, speed and run a red light, you're going to get a ticket. When you cheat on your taxes, there's still consequences. <laughs> there's still consequences. When we sin, there are going to be temporal consequences. This is the nature of life. You cannot set something into motion and expect that there will be no repercussion for it. But when Jesus set us free, he set us free from the ultimate consequence that we made right with him. Eternal death and eternal separation from God are the consequences we won't have to face if Jesus set you free. Because in Jesus, we have Freedom. The last one. Freedom from guilt. Your past cannot haunt us. Didn't I already do that? I think I did. I don't know. We're <laughs> Go from accusation. Yeah, the next one. So, so we had freedom from guilt. That's right. Freedom from guilt, freedom from consequences. The last one is freedom from accusation. 
We no longer have to live in fear. Pastor Jeff, where do you get that? Well, cool, let me share with you. I want you to write this down if you would. Colossians chapter 1, verse 22. This is the NIV. It says, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. There's a key word here that I want you to, to, to really take home today, and that's blameless. Because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we are blameless before God when we know his son, Jesus. Blameless. The word blameless literally means free of guilt, not subject to blame. That means when you be reach the, uh, God one day, he can't, he, you are going to be blameless before his sight because of what Christ paid for you. Jesus took care of the eternal consequence of sin, but he did more than that. He also took care of our guilt. He satisfied the requirements of the law. When the law is, is broken, a death was required, and he paid that penalty for us. Therefore, not on our own. I'll say it again. It's not on our own, but through Christ, we are free of guilt and not subject to blame anymore. That's what we should be celebrating this Freedom Independence Sunday. So we can stand before God and our fellow man and not fear accusation. Being free of accusation does not mean accusations will not come. We'll certainly face accusation of sorts in this life. People have seen our sins and mistake and they don't, and they want to know why we now claim to be different. Listen, I've been told I, the hardest thing for my friends when I was growing up was when I changed my life and gave my life to Christ because they kept trying to remind me who I was in high school and in college. And every time they met my wife, Raquel, and we would go out with Raquel in our first year of marriage, they began to tell her all the things that I did in college. They just could not get over. And they kept accusing me and reminding me of this horrible person that I used to be before Christ. But the beauty of it is I could stand there next to my wife, have my arm around her, and not care what they said because I was not that man anymore. And then what it did, it gave me an opportunity. Look, this shouldn't threaten us. It should be an opportunity to share with them the transformation that Jesus brings to our lives. <laughs> so we need not fear accusation. We are now free of guilt. We are no longer subject to blame. The account has been laid to rest. And we can live without fear of a hidden past being brought to light. It has already been brought to light. And it's already been dealt with. The problem that we have today, I feel like, is that we try to cheapen out the experience of what God really did for us. We want everyone just to think that God is good and God is love and it's so easy to know Jesus and he's just going to forgive you. You just tell Jesus you love him. But I need you to understand, if we don't turn... To Jesus, our next slide, and confess our sin and allow him to cleanse us, we are slaves to our past and to our guilt. We are susceptible to accusation, but once we come clean, you're free. You're no longer a slave to that sin. See, that, that's why I, I don't want to be a church that just preaches really cute theology and tells you how to, to, to just have your best Monday that you could ever have. Hallelujah. I want you to know that there's some real ugly things that you need to deal with and allow God to forgive you of. I want you to know that just because you know Christ is your personal Lord and Savior doesn't mean your Monday is going to be a perfect Monday and you can just be hallelujah. It just means that when that Monday comes, I now have the Holy Spirit who can help me get through that Monday with a different attitude and a different source of joy. You understand that joy just doesn't happen because I have a smile on my face. 
but I can have joy because of who I have inside my heart. We're sitting, we had some people ask, Pastor Jeff, how, how are you going to preach? What? You don't need to preach this week. And you don't, listen, I, my heart is broken. My dad is gone. My mom's is broken. But I still have the joy of the Lord in my heart. And I can still preach the gospel of Jesus because I had a father who showed me the gospel of Jesus every day. There's a difference. And I'm not afraid to have a church of only 100 or 200 if we preach true theology and we go after kingdom things. I don't want to be a big church because we have all the greatest Monday gifts. And I can sh we can throw a ball up in the air and do all. I want to be a church that is a part of transforming lives. Because when we come to Jesus, the Son of God, and let the Son set us free, church, we are free from guilt, we are free from the ultimate consequence of our sinful lives, and we are free from accusation. Freedom today is what you can have. Freedom from guilt. As the team comes up, It's just a reality of what we're in today and what we're doing. There's a reality of what we're surrounded by in our world. There's a reality in, in what's happening in your neighborhoods and in your homes. And there, the simple reality is this. The reality is, is that this world is crying out for a move of God. They just don't know it. This world, your family, your, your coworkers, your neighbors, they are so desperate and they're so, they're seeking and they're, all these things are looking to satisfy and nothing satisfying. Why won't it satisfy? Because the only thing that will ever satisfy is Christ. But the difference is, now more than ever, I think he's telling the church it's time to get on the bus and it's time to move. And for him to move means that we have to understand that I don't have to carry my guilt of my past anymore, that I can be free. I don't have to worry about accusations and if someone would see me, uh, that, that would see me at different places and they would see me at church or they would see me serving and they would come up and say, what are you doing here? I didn't know you go to church. That's nothing to be afraid of because it's the greatest opportunity to say, well, you're right. But let me tell you what Christ did in my life. See, we got it all twisted. Never before have I felt like there's such a stirring and a calling where we need to get ready to be a part of a great awakening. But it can't just be us. It just can't be a, a, a core group. It just can't be 30 of us. It really can't be just Redemption City. I've been reaching out. I've been, I really want to start aligning with some other churches to be a part of a greater expanded move of God. Revival is not just going to happen in Lithopolis and Canal and Groveport. For our nation to be changed, revival needs to break out in this nation. So I want to begin to start partnering and finding and lining up with churches who are hungry for a move of God, who are ready to be willing, who are ready to say, I was nothing before. I may not have education. I may not have these things, but I'm willing to say yes, and I'm willing to go to that hospital and see that big giant and be terrified, but just open my mouth and let Holy Spirit take over and see what God does. That, that's what I want to see. That's the freedom that we experience 
Yes, we're thankful that we get freedoms today as a nation. But this, this freedom that needs to be shouting from the rooftops is you don't longer have to carry your guilt anymore. You don't have to worry about your sin condemning you for all eternity. You don't have to worry about accusations. But when Christ comes in and does a work in your life and he fills you with the Holy Ghost, then I can be set free. Then I can see a move of God. Then I can lay hands and pray on people. And it's not me healing people. I'm just a vessel being used by God that I'm just saying yes in the storms. I, I can't wait for the day that I see churches full of five-year-olds to a hundred-year-olds with the same vision and dream and authority moving in and out of this place. That we see the greatest people who are so full of addictions and hurts set free and setting other people free. That we see a mission like we've never seen. We have a great mission field here as well. Our country needs a move of God. And the move of God, my grandfather used to always say, and I say it a lot here, for revival to happen, it has to first happen within you before it can happen anywhere else. And that comes with a cost. Jeff said it. It comes with a cost. And I want us to be this Independence Day as we get ready to stand and worship today. I want us as a church to be willing to say, Lord, I don't care the cost. I don't care the price. I don't care if I think I can or I'm good enough or I have the qualities or what. I'm just willing to open my mouth and let Holy Spirit do what it's called to do. And for that to happen, I must, some of us need to come to a place where we get refilled with the Holy Spirit and allow God and a new fire to burn in our belly. Some of us have been walking on some old wine skin and he's trying to give us some new wine but we're not getting it because we're so full of the old wine skin. We gotta let go and let God be who he's called us to be. So as we stand this morning close our eyes for a second no one looking around I wonder if some would say you know what Pastor Jeff I've been carrying this guilt and shame around for years I'm hurting I've allowed this, my, this guilt I've allowed my past I've allowed these things to become my identity and I want God to create in me a new identity today I wonder if some would say, you know what, Pastor Jeff, I want to have the boldness that Jeff and Angie shared, and I want to be able to go to the prison, or I want to be able to go to the hospital, and I want to be able to stand in front of my child, and, and I want to just be able to open my mouth and complete surrender and allow you to move. That's the simplest thing that you could do, is just have a heart that was willing to say yes. This Independence Day, this Freedom Weekend. What if a church in Lithopolis at Redemption City caught true freedom and experienced true freedom this morning? So if there's any area in your life where you're struggling, where you're caring, where you've prayed before and it hasn't happened, and all these say this guilt and this garbage and the lies of the enemy has you controlled and just defeated. If there's any part of you that's dealing with this and just is ready to experience a new freedom today, we got our team up here ready to pray for you. And I want you to come. Forget who you were. Forget who who's looking or who's watching or who. What price are you willing to pay? Are you willing to get out of the sea and allowing God to do a move of God in your life. I'm going to ask you if you would come this morning.
have those areas in your life. I have those areas in my life where I'm like, oh Lord, I don't know if I want to give you all of this because it's just better if I hold on to it. But the Lord's saying, just release it all to me. Release it all to me. Put all of your faith in him. Put all of your trust in him. And that means abandoning yourself. And it's hard. It's hard to let go. But this morning, I want us to be a people that just fully dive into him, leaving nothing back, leaving nothing back and just giving everything that we are, our hope, our mind, our heart, our soul. So let's just sing that right now, all my love. All my love, all my love, all my without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began ash was redeemed only beauty Oh, 
to be free and that freedom reigns in this house today and Lord I pray that freedom will begin to just we just begin to let it be part of our life Monday through Saturday as well but God we honor you today we thank you for the freedom that we experience today we thank you for all you're doing Lord God but Lord we thank you because like we always say we know the best is yet to come And Lord, we honor you today. We worship you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Hey, uh, real quick, right after, don't forget if you're going to stay and 
and uh, play uh, cornhole to sign up. Uh, the champ.